Gospel of Luke, chapters 15 and 16. It is remarkable to see how the Lord attracted those spurned in society. His holiness did not distance people, but drew them closer. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. In response, the self-righteous Pharisees and scribes complained that he received sinners and ate with them. So, in one of the most well-known passages of Scripture, the Lord took the opportunity to explain the joy that God has in saving the lost. In Luke 15, the Lord Jesus gives a beautiful picture of himself. The shepherd searches for one lost sheep, finds it and brings it safely home. It is the story of three journeys. The journey the lost sheep took, the one the shepherd took, and the journey of the shepherd with his sheep. The first journey describes where we were without God, lost. The second journey represents the cost of our salvation, Jesus coming to where we were. The third journey describes the joy and power of a love from which we can never be separated, and of our glorious destiny. In John's Gospel, Jesus doesn't give us an illustration. He tells us clearly, I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd gives his life for the sheep, John 10 verse 11. He wanted us to understand without any doubt his love for us. In Luke 23, the Lord Jesus does not speak in a parable, nor describe who he is. He proves it. If ever a man was lost, it was the dying thief. Jesus, in the very act of dying as the saviour of the world, finds this man. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Verse 43. The Lord Shepherd's heart has not changed. Let's rest in him, worship him, follow him, witness to him, and never forget that his love will carry us home. In the second parable, we see the searching work of the Holy Spirit in the parable of the lost silver coin. The Lord Jesus, in telling these stories, was reaching out to two audiences, those with bad reputations, the tax collectors and sinners, and those who were self-righteous, the Pharisees and scribes. He used language and settings both audiences would understand, and they would relate to the importance of a valuable lost coin. The woman is an illustration of the person and work of the Holy Spirit. His work is to glorify the Lord Jesus, and a vital part of this is bringing people to salvation. The first thing the woman did was to light a lamp. In Psalm 119 verse 105, the Word of God is described as a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. We read of the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, in Ephesians 6 verse 16. The Spirit of God uses the Word of God to convict people of their need for the Saviour and bring them to salvation. The Lord also describes the woman sweeping the house. Rather like the sower, there is an expansiveness about the work of the Spirit. At the same time, there is a focus on the individual. The woman searched carefully until she found the lost coin. Here, the language is the same as in the story of the lost sheep. The shepherd searched until he found the creature. Both parables end in joy. Hebrews 12 verse 2 speaks of Jesus as the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The Holy Spirit has ministered ceaselessly throughout the day of grace to bring people to Christ. He works through the people of God and the Word of God to bring the light of the Gospel into this dark world and embrace the redeemed within the body of Christ. And he connects us with the joy of heaven by filling our hearts with joy. Romans 14 verse 17. In the final parable in Luke 15, the Lord gives us a powerful insight into the heart of God the Father. But it begins with what was in the youngest son's heart. Father, give me. These three words clearly describe how the youngest son saw his father only as a provider. It is a telling picture of people's view of God. They want God to give them exactly what they want and not to interfere in their lives. I cannot recall how often people have said, if there is a God, why doesn't he? The extraordinary feature of this story is that the father gave his son everything he requested and the first thing he did was to leave. We believe that we could do so much better by ourselves despite the overwhelming evidence to the contrary. The youngest son illustrates what putting a great distance between himself and the father who loved him led to. He didn't lose everything, he spent everything. No one took his inheritance away, he gave it away. He was responsible for his loss 
and when he had nothing, he learnt the bitter lesson that the world would not provide him with anything. But it was the loss of everything which transformed his life. I remember a brother telling me how he grew up in a Christian home and turned his back on the faith of his parents. He woke up one night after another bout of heavy drinking in the gutter, and in the words of Luke 15, he came to himself. It was easy for the son to leave his father's house, a wealthy young man, but it was a painful journey to return poverty-stricken. Yet it is in our nothingness we discover the fullness of the heart of God. The son had never known his father's heart when he lived in his house. Only when he returned home in repentance did he discover his father's profound love for him. The father had longed for the day his son would return, how many tears he had shed, and how many days had he known when his hopes were dashed because his young son had not returned. The speed at which the father ran to his son was far swifter than the son's approach to his father. The son expressed his utter failure, but the father never allowed him to finish his rehearsed words, make me like one of your hired servants. The son only wanted to be safe. He did not expect the love that overwhelmed him. But he never entered the father's house as a servant, but as a son, clothed, not in rags, but in the best robe, not in poverty, but with a ring on his finger, not in shame, but with shoes on his feet. All of this was given to him. The son discovered how great a giver his father was, and he understood for the first time the source of that giving, a love which dealt with all his need and sin and transformed him by its power. Why did the publicans and sinners draw near to Jesus at the beginning of Luke 15? They knew in their hearts the emptiness, not of what they had lost, but of what they had accumulated. Like Zacchaeus, that emptiness had drawn them to the Saviour, never realising the Saviour had come to meet them. Like so many, including ourselves, they knew a time when they did not understand the immensity of the steps that God, the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Father took to redeem us and transform us into the children of God. The Father has clothed us in the righteousness of Christ, sealed us with the Holy Spirit, and caused us to walk as his children. Surprisingly, it is possible to forget how deeply I am loved by God. At such times, we can thank the prodigal son for reminding us of the father's heart. It is a discovery we should share. But the prodigal son's story includes the older brother's story. This brother never left his father's house. He never wasted what the father gave to him. But he was very similar to his younger brother because although he lived with his father, he never understood his father's heart. The story gives us a vivid insight into the dangers of self-righteousness. It is self-obsessed and self-glorifying. Its energy comes from our view of what we think we are and what we do and our condemnation of the failures in others. But self-righteousness distances us from God and blinds us to our need for his salvation. We also make the mistake of thinking it is a religious problem. Still, its influence is evident throughout society and is at the roots of many of the world's problems. It seeks to control others and makes people's lives joyless and resentful of the joy others experience. We see this so clearly in the older brother. He did not run into the room to embrace his brother. There were no kisses or tears, just anger, bitterness, resentment and separation. The father had to go out again to plead with his older son. It must have caused the father heartache of a different kind to hear what his older son felt. I have served you. I have never transgressed. You never gave me. The older brother poured out such ill feeling, not towards his brother, whom he discarded as an immoral man, but towards his father. Despite all the years he spent in his father's company, he had no sense of his father's love for him. That love was expressed in the gentle words which followed. Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. Christ loved the tax collectors like Zacchaeus, and the Pharisees like Saul of Tarsus. In whatever form it takes, God cuts through all our needs to reveal his love for us. The father adds, your brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. God's love not only deals with our distance from him, it deals with our distance from each other. It brings us into a fellowship of life where we are one in Christ Jesus, whatever our background. 
Because we are loved, we are empowered to demonstrate the love of Christ to each other. The elder brother resented the father who loved him and despised the brother who needed his love. The father added, it was right that we should make merry and be glad. That day, mercy and truth had met together and righteousness and peace had kissed. Psalm 85 verse 10. The self-righteousness of the elder brother had no place in the father's house. Chapter 16 begins with an unusual parable about another man who wasted what was given to him. There was a certain rich man who had a steward and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship for you can no longer be a steward. The steward who had no other means of earning a living placed others in his debt by fraudulently reducing their indebtedness to his master. One by one, he discounted the invoices of his master's debtors. Surprisingly, the master commended the unjust steward for his initiative. Everything about this process and the people involved is unrighteous. But the Lord is describing the shrewdness and ingenuity a wasteful man displays to provide for himself. Such cleverness is frequently expressed by how people deal with others and material possessions. The parable is a challenge to all of us to use what we possess in the service of the Lord honestly, wisely, intelligently and sacrificially. The disgraced steward asked the debtor, how much do you owe my master? We should ask ourselves, how much do I owe my saviour? And seek to devote all that we have and are to him. The Pharisees are described as lovers of money and heard what Jesus said, but chose to disregard his words. But the Lord drives the message home. You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Jesus explained that John the Baptist completed the Old Testament ministry of the law and the prophets. And it was John who fearlessly said to the Pharisees and Sadducees, brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. It appears to have had little effect on this self-righteous group who were a law to themselves. But Jesus makes it clear that the law would judge their covetousness. The Lord surprisingly introduces the matter of divorce, adultery and remarriage. The Lord is still addressing the Pharisees and appears to be highlighting their love of money as an idol taking the place of God in their lives. The final passage of the chapter demonstrates the path the love of money leads us down. Paul explains that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The greatest sorrow is the end of the rich man's life. Lazarus was a diseased, starving beggar lying outside a rich man's home who could have transformed his life. The rich man could have argued he could not help all the beggars that were so common in Israel, but he could have helped the one who was his neighbour. In Luke 10, the lawyer asked Jesus, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus asked him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? And the lawyer replied, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbour as yourself. Jesus told him, you have answered rightly, this do and you will live. The lawyer had not asked a sincere question, and wanted to justify himself by asking, and who is my neighbour? The neighbour Jesus described was the one who showed mercy. Every day, the rich man walked out of his house and passed by on the other side, ignoring the pitiful stranger outside his home. He had every opportunity to be a neighbour to Lazarus. We are all beggars in our natural state before God. We need the Good Samaritan to save us. Salvation compels us to be compassionate. The rich man did not know of God's love in his heart or seek it. And he went into eternity poor. Christ became poor so we could be eternally rich. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9.